I want to introduce Ram with and this film. So the film's been featured in five different film festivals globally. It's had nine UK screenings. I think there was supposed to be one last one before lockdown that didn't happen. Um, it's won an award at Ottawa Film Festival for, for Best Documentary and Remit's the person that's made it all happen. So thank you Remit for taking time out to speak to us today. Oh, thank you so much um, to the team for inviting me to speak at this um, like very well known um, platform now. It's it's really exciting to see how many people are coming together um, each time and and kind of getting a dose of their kind of Indian culture. Now I want to go straight to the beginning of this film. Um, the concept was formed in 2014 and from then you went out to make this film. So you've been championing what everybody everybody will have heard about the farmers' protest. You've been championing the farmers long before the farmers protest started can you tell us how it all started in 2014 yeah so it's been a long long journey um so in 2014 the beginning of 2014 was when um myself and my colleague Lever questani decided to make this film um so we it was um i always say that it this uh, film was the process of making this film was peppered with a lot of luck and a lot of um grace because a lot of things came together, which, you know, it, it was just a lot of it was luck. Um, and so Lever and I were both um, on, we were, we were kind of young, we were in our 20s and we were both on our backpacking journeys. Uh, so we were backpacking around Asia and Lever had been doing that. So she'd been doing that since 2011. So she'd been literally on the road for three years. And I was just going on a six month trip. And so our paths were going to cross in India. Um, and she said, let's make a film together. And I said, OK. And she was like, well, you're from India. So what should we make a film about? And the only thing that I could think of was the farmer suicide issue. And um, obviously now everyone knows about farmer suicide in Punjab and in India. But at that time, it was not such a big issue. Um, but for me, I mean, as a Punjabi, like you kind of mentioned, it's it's really important to have that connection. And I've struggled to make that connection, um, you know, since I was young because I don't speak Punjabi um, and I'm kind of regarded by my friends as a coconut, so brown on the outside and white on the inside. And just kind of like this idea that I, I don't really have much of a connection with my um, culture. So it's kind of, yeah, I'm a bit of a laughing stock with my family um, because, yeah, two girls, none of whom, you know, neither of whom spoke Punjabi, just went out to Punjab and made this film. Um, and so, yeah, we came from very, very humble beginnings, for sure. And in uh, October of 2014, we went out to Punjab to, to film this documentary. So we had minimal kit because we were both literally, we had just our backpacks. Um, and we were hoping to make a five minute short film. Um, and that's what we had planned for. We'd done a lot of planning, we'd um, researched, we'd got in touch with farmers and all that kind of thing. But it was for a five minute short film. And, you know, you wouldn't believe how much goes into just making a five minute short film. Um, and so we went there and while we were filming, we kind of realized that this is not going to fit into a five minute film anymore because the, the depth at which, you know, each interview was going into and the, the stories which were being uncovered were so much like they were just so much more powerful than we had ever expected. We had kind of seen this as a um, like a trial run or just just a short film while we were traveling. Um, and we realized that this was actually a, a really big deal. So while we were filming, um, I always kind of say this, that the next person we spoke to, we would say, oh, yeah, um, you know, we're making a 10 minute film and we were kind of unsure and we were like, oh, let's just say 10 minutes. And then, you know, the next village we'd go to, they would say, how long is the film? And we'd say 20 minutes and then 30 minutes. And then there was a point when we, we just had to say we don't know. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't until uh, so obviously we can. So after that month, we spent a month, just over a month filming. Mm -hmm. We traveled all around Punjab. We filmed in Amritsar, in the Thind in Sangrur. Uh, in Anandpur Saib and then we continued our travels and then we came back together um, in uh, I think it was early 2015 and so this is a photo of Lever and I doing Seva at Harmandar Saib yeah. in Amritsar <laughs> and so um, yeah so we came to edit uh, in 2015 at some point I think it was the beginning of 2015 and it was then that we realized after about a month of 
editing that this was a feature length film, this was a full length film. And I think we were both, um, that made us really nervous because we didn't, obviously we didn't have any budget. We had just gone out because that's what we wanted to do. There was no budget. There was no um, plan to spend this much time on it. And so um, we spent another two months editing. So we spent three months editing, literally took three months off work, edited full time, 9 a.m. till 10 p.m. every day. And then after that, we kind of trailed off and we started doing it on weekends and things like that so that we could still kind of have some semblance of a life. Um, and then, <laughs> and then um, yeah, I mean, fast forward a few years, we've had our cinema screenings. It was, uh, yeah, it was such a milestone to have had um, the film go into cinemas after all that time working on it. Um, and then we yeah as you said we were going to have one more cinema screening but we've just pushed the um the kind of online release forward so it's available on amazon prime and nishani plus um so yeah it's available to watch now for anyone who hasn't watched it yet and um if you haven't watched it please uh kind of uh stick around because when there's not going to be any kind of spoilers in this conversation yeah absolutely i think now if, let's just show a short trailer from the film so people can get an idea of what the film's like. So if you can show the trailer, that would be lovely. Eko jida hai sada khiti da tanda. Sada sabno bada prosa rab nalai. Pesticide south to badi market hogi me khair Asia di. It's a major problem. We don't have too many years. Maybe two, three decades, and then everything collapses here. Green revolution, I rather call. Greed revolution. कई बार इतना पता नहीं होता दवाइयाँ रे फालतू बांधने के मेरी फसल मारी नहीं आ रही है पर वो खान दे जोग दे इतना रहें दी नहीं पर करिए कि ये जिम्मे ना एक आमली होता है आमली होता है वो हो अपने पुक्की खादे बिना फीम खादे बिना वो खेच कम नहीं कर सकता और वो खाऊगा ताऊ खेच चलू वो ही एक अटीन बन गया साढ़ मेरा जी करते बस मैं खुदकुशी करना है नहर छाल मार के मर जाना या कहीं भी ट्रक के थले आ जा मेरे तो जी नहीं जाती हूँ मेरा बुरा हाल है जो इन्हों का डैडी मुके ये छोटे बच्चे ने दोनों कोई सुरत नहीं हैगी ये अठ साल दी मनप्रीत डैडी करजे के बहुत ज़्यादा दुखी हो गए थे उन्हें औखा होके जाके स्परे पी ली once we overexploit the soil, the water, and we pollute the air, we are bound to pay the price. We are actually committing crimes. We can sow seed and seed grow, and it gives a great uh, amount of joy to see that miracle of nature that is reproducing itself on a daily basis. It is marvelous. The farmer is someone who can be independent, and he can be uh, his own master, actually, on his own land. We have a legacy to leave for the next generation, so it is our, our duty to work with nature. So that trailer there just gives us a slight glimpse into all the different themes in the film. Um, so it was finally released in 2019. You started on the journey in 2014, and we've been on. I've been working you with you alongside you just to help get that push there. But you hear from the farmers and their families themselves. Um, the films, so much of it is in Punjabi. Um, why was it so important for you to not have a narrative over the film? Yeah, so I think our our main um, focus for this film, so just to give you a little bit of background of Lever and I, so Lever studied um, film production at the Arts University in Bournemouth where I studied photography, so that's kind of our background. Um, and we're both um, really interested in documentary, that's that's the field that we both, um, that, that resonates with both of us. And so there are different ways of making documentaries. For us, it's really important that um, we are kind of, um, raising the voices of the people that we are filming. So it's less about creating a narrative for them and more about just amplifying their voices, allowing them to speak and giving them a platform, you know, with which they can address more people. That's, that was always the aim. And so with toxification, 
there's no narration. Um, that it's literally the story is told through the through the mouths of the farmers. And I think that's really important because at the moment we're hearing a lot in the news um, about, you know, everything that's going on. And we've we've heard a lot of statistics and things like that. And maybe we've seen um, short clips from farmers about their situation, but it's kind of more related to what's going on now um, in Delhi. But what's what I feel has been missing is actually a real conversation with the farmers. And that's what toxification provides. So, it, you know, the interviews are really, really in-depth and we're really um, just, you know, so humbled that the farmers were able to share so honestly with us. But that's the that's the main thing. That's the most important thing. Um, we didn't want to um, create like kind of like a propaganda film or a film which is um, one sided. We wanted to for it to be as neutral as possible. And that's why we also spoke with um, government officials. We spoke with um, uh, a gentleman from the Department of Agriculture and we spoke with, um, you know, all sorts of agricultural experts. So, yeah, we feel that we've created something which is kind of as neutral as possible. Um, and it's it's not um, yeah it's the aim of it is not to push people in a certain direction. It, the aim is just to allow people to make up their own minds and to amplify the voices of the farmers so that they can tell you exactly how they feel and what they're experiencing. I think when you watch the film, um, I've been lucky to have watched it many times on the big screen as well as watched it watched it here on my laptop as well. But you do feel. We talk about characters in the film, but they're not characters, they're real people. And you do start identifying with with them. They're human, they're people. The more you hear hear their stories, the more you feel. There is there is a very human connection. Um, and there are several stories and, and my I think my two that I connected with the most that really get to me are Guru Pratap Singh, who we saw in that trailer, talking about how he wanted to commit suicide. And then, then there's another elderly, um, Amarjit Singh, um, elderly farmer, Amarjit Singh, who tells his story. And for me, I think of my grandparents, I think of my Naniji again, and, you know, when, when you think that, and, and it, it, it is, it does make you wonder when I feel that much emotion when I watch the film, you spent a month out there with them your personal connection with these characters, with these people, because um, that's who they are, they're not characters in a film, with these real people in this film. How was that for you? Yeah, I mean, even now, I, I always well up in interviews when, you know, every single cinema screening that we had, obviously, Geert and I were, um, we were watching, and every single time we were kind of in tears. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop and it doesn't, um, you never um, kind of build up a tolerance to this kind of thing. And I think you're right, especially because I was there, um, having actually spoken to these people, having lived with these people for over a month, um, it was really, really special for me. And, and also because I'd never had that experience before, I'd never um, been to the Bind or lived in the Bind before. So that was really, really magical for me. Um, but I remember one moment where Amarjeet Singh, the, the farmer who uh, you were just speaking about, he, um, so we'd done his interview and, and it was really, really emotional, really tough. And afterwards he said to me, um, thank you. And I said, why are you thanking me? I, I have literally done nothing. And I, I actually felt quite, um, I felt quite bad for having asked him to kind of relive his story, which was clearly, you know, a very challenging thing to do. Mm. Um, and so I said, why are you thanking me? And he said, no one has ever asked to hear my story. No one has ever been interested in hearing my story. No one has ever um, wanted to know my reasons behind, you know, the things that I've done in my life or the choices that I've made in my life. And that was when I realized that the process of making a documentary is almost just as important as the end product. So when it came to um, you as a Punjabi woman, a young Punjabi woman as a filmmaker, obviously we talk about how women have it so difficult in the arts and, and breaking through and things like that. But as a young Punjabi filmmaker, how has that helped you in this process? I think firstly, I felt a real responsibility to um, be the one to make this film. Um, being a Punjabi and and knowing how the media can really twist things or they can kind of have their own take on it and it can become a one-sided thing. I was really 
keen to ensure that if this story was going to be covered, it was, you know, at least half of the team was Punjabi because, you know, it's, it's just important. And so, um, yeah, that was really important to me. Um, I've gone a little bit off track yet. Can you just remind me what your question was? <laughs> so it, it was um, basically asking about how you being a young Punjabi filmmaker, how was there a benefit of being? Usually we see that as a, you know, difficult, it's difficult to break those ceilings, difficult to break through. But, you know, were there any positives of being a Punjabi filmmaker in this process? Yeah, I mean, I think probably the farmers, I think I was probably the laughing stock there as well, because I was the Punjabi who didn't speak Punjabi. Oh, okay. And I remember there were points, there was a point where we were filming um, a group of women who were farming um, just by themselves during the daytime. And I was just kind of like fumbling by and getting by with my like limited Punjabi. And they, one of them literally said to me, what, don't you speak Punjabi? And I was just like, no. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think it probably did help to understand the culture and to understand the customs. Um, but I learned a lot actually about um, my heritage and about being Punjabi just, you know, during that process. But as a woman also, I think that's another challenge um, because obviously I, I work in a male dominated field and I've had like so many instances from 2014 and before to now, um, you know, during the cinema screenings, my husband would be there and, and, every single screening people would go up to him and shake his hand and say well done and he'd say she made it before she met me you know but that was that was a really common thing um but i think also in some ways like in terms of a silver lining um it was there was a massive benefit to being two young girls making this film because there wasn't a big crew there was it was literally just the two of us and we had um, two young boys who were our translator and our runner. So it was literally just four kids, essentially, um, kind of like rocking up in a Jeep and doing these interviews in the middle of the fields. So that's literally how it was. Um, and being females, I think that helps um, to have certain challenging conversations. This is Hakika, our translator, helping me with uh, uh, <laughs> a um, tracking shot, which is on a skateboard on a plank of wood. That's literally, that sums up the, um, the way that we made this film. <laughs> and um, yeah, so in terms of being two young women, um, I feel like a lot of the farmers felt they were able to open up to us because we were women. Um, and, you know, we were able to have conversations about feelings and emotions, which might have been a little bit more difficult if there were men involved or if it was a big crew or things like that. So I'm really um, happy that we were kind of able to be in that position. And I feel really proud of how far we've come as female filmmakers to have this film, which I really believe is so powerful on a mainstream platform now. I think that is really, really important. But just looking at this image here that's on the screen right now, and you've just talked about the skateboard and you were going out there to make a short film. Um, I'm guessing you didn't have much equipment with you. So was that a challenge as well? And were they happy to help you? And how did that all work for you? Because you've made a feature length film with very little, we're talking about budget, but when you went out there, like I said, you didn't expect to do this. Yeah, we we had very, very minimal equipment, but I think my philosophy is less about um, the the kind of technical side. It's more about the stories and it's more about um, the feelings and the emotions and the depth. Um, I think you can get really caught up in technical the technical side and cameras and things. And obviously, I love that stuff. I, I studied a degree in photography, uh, but yeah for me that that shines through and I think it's an opportunity to be more creative with with less kit so yeah I, I relished that opportunity and you know I was the one that kind of said do you have a skateboard and a plank of wood because you know why not let's uh let's create something and be you know think outside the box so yeah I loved it it was brilliant <laughs> and now going back to the themes of the film so farmer suicide was a really big theme that you went out there to explore. And since 1995, there've been over 300,000 farmer suicides in the Punjab alone, let alone the rest of India. Um, so it's a huge theme. Why did you think it was so important and what other themes emerged as you started exploring farmer suicides? 
So I had read a newspaper article about the farmer suicides. This is back in the beginning of 2014. That's when I realized that it was it was a big issue. Um, I, I think I've always been quite interested in mental health and I've I've studied that further in in my kind of work in the last few years. But that that was what really interested me. What I didn't realize was that there are other issues in Punjab which all kind of lean on each other to create the situation that we've got. So it's a very, very complex situation. And obviously we won't go too much into it, but it's it's about more than just farmer suicide. There are lots of different things which come together to create a very, very challenging situation. Um, and yeah, that's something that we didn't expect when we were doing our kind of pre-production work. We had no idea that these, that the other issues would be so, um, would kind of, uh, you know, create the farmer suicide. We, we thought they might um, be part of the story, but maybe a small part of the story. We didn't realize that it's literally just a triangle. It's literally a triangle of three issues which come together um, to create a really, really challenging situation. And that situation is the same situation which the farmers are protesting now. Um, you know, in that sense, nothing has changed. And we don't know what's going to happen with the um, agricultural bills, but um, I suppose time will tell. But, you know, that's what's really interesting about toxification. It, it gives context to what's going on now. And obviously context is important because if we don't, you know, you know, read deeply and study deeply into what's going on and what's behind, you know, what's underneath the kind of surface level of the challenge, then we're not going to have a deep understanding of um, how we can help and, and what might support Punjab to move forward. And I think this has been really interesting because you started this film long before the farmers' protests, as I mentioned earlier. You've been taking this film up and down the country and globally since 2019. Now, what's the response been like before the farmers' protests? How easy was it for you to capture the audiences with this film? It's been a challenge um, and I attribute that um, I suppose partly to the fact that I was um, I, I don't have a huge amount of experience with this or I didn't you know when we came together in 2019 I was you know and I was and I always have been a filmmaker and a creative and um, less interested and less skilled in terms of marketing and that's why you were really helpful Keith, with Punjab Arts and all of the organizations that have supported us have really really helped with that because as creatives we're not interested in that and you know it's not something that we um, want to do or, or maybe are very good at um, so that's the first thing in terms of the audiences it was I found it really tough um, I remember we had our first, um, uh, like we got into our first film festival, which was UK Asian Film Festival, which is a massive film festival. And I was over the moon, like I was so delighted that it had got into this film festival that I have been to like a number of times. It's it's one of the two Indian film festivals in London. Um, and so we got into the um, Edinburgh kind of portion of it. And so we traveled to Edinburgh and, you know, I was I was so excited and the audience that came, there was not one Singh or there was not one Punjabi or not one Indian in the audience. And I was I was really, really saddened and shocked by that because I assumed that, you know, it would be something that they would be really interested in. So at the beginning, I think there were a lot of kind of uh, English, British audiences. Um, and then, yeah, I suppose. I suppose as we moved forward and we began to tap into different audiences and you were really, really supportive with that, Kirith, um, then the audiences became a little bit more diverse. But I was, you know, it's it's really, it's actually a really amazing thing if you look at it another way, that there are people who are not from our community that are genuinely interested in what's happening in Punjab. I think um, a lot of us might be guilty of kind of um, only taking notice when it affects us or when it affects our community. Um, so to see that, you know, that was a predominantly white audience was actually, in some ways, it was it was really, really beautiful to see. And many people after um, the screening came up to me and said, you know, it was really brilliant. I didn't know about this. Um, so, yeah, there's there's always a plus sign. And the, I noticed in some of the screenings that we've been at, um, there's been a bit of a hesit hesitancy in the audience but the reaction to the films has always been overwhelming. And what's been the thing that's 
that, that, that you've thought, thought the most about when an audience has responded to the film? What, what's been the most prevalent thing? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, what do you mean? So like we've had different audiences, but when we've turned to um, some of the smaller screen screenings, we've had a lot of Punjabi people come, what's been the biggest issue that they've raised every time? I've not um, been to all the screenings, so I know from the ones that I'm thinking of, I can think of certain issues, but yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think a lot of Punjabis connected with it and they kind of connected their families back home um, and they kind of thought, oh, yeah, I know someone who's suffering from this thing that you mentioned in the film. So that was quite nice, being able to kind of facilitate that sort of connection. Um, in terms of responses, a lot of people want to know um, what I'm doing in Punjab um, to, to help the farmers. Uh, obviously, I care about the farmers, obviously. I wouldn't have made this film if I if I didn't really care. But um, in terms of my skill set, I'm a filmmaker and that's what I love doing. And that's what I think um, I'm sort of half good at. Um, so, yeah, we've had a lot of questions about, well, what are you doing? Are, are you not setting up a charity? Are you not um, giving aid to the farmers? Are you not developing things like that? And I would love to be part of a team that does that. Um, but for me personally, that's not something that I feel equipped to do. I know along the way you faced many challenges from our own community and if you want to share those it might you know it's difficult to speak to our own community sometimes about the challenges they put forward in front of you I, I don't know if you want to share those and how you've tackled them and how things have changed with the farmers protests coming about yeah I think the protest has changed everything I think um uh yeah I mean in in some ways it's it's quite challenging to now see that everyone cares um so, you know, before when we were, you know, we really worked hard <laughs> to try and get bums on seats and it was really challenging. And yeah. to know that, um, you know, and I remember having conversations with um, different organisations and I'd say, you know, can you help us? Can you support us with this film? And I had many people saying, you know, that you've, you've kind of passed the boat and this is not an issue anymore. Um, and obviously no one, no one wanted this situation to happen no one wanted the farmers to have to protest um but but in some ways it's sort of enlightened a lot of people that they need to um, look into this and a lot of people have been educating themselves and understanding the issue and supporting toxification so um yeah i mean it's it's quite challenging because Keith and i have literally been banging on about this for years <laughs> and <laughs> and you know not to say that we're sort of jumping on the, um, you know, I don't know, on this situation in order to push toxification forward because we're not. It's just, it's, it's, and again, grace that this film has ended up being um, accepted onto a global platform just at the time that these protests are happening. That's, um, you know, I've, I've always been so impatient with this project. Obviously, since 2014, I've, I've been constantly trying to like hurry everything up and now I understand why it had to take this long. So in some ways it's, it's, it's been really positive and in other ways it's the, the journey has been quite frustrating, um, kind of feeling like um, I was knocking on a lot of doors and not really getting a lot of support. But I think, uh, yeah, we kind of just have to move forward and, and um, yeah, I suppose it, it brings up the question of, are we supporting um, our community enough? Are we supporting the arts enough, um, Punjabi arts? Because I think we all, everyone on this call must, you know, have an interest in the arts to be here. So, you know, can we do more? I think that's really a question we, you know, can all be asking ourselves. For me, as, the, and as an artistic director for Punjab Arts, working with artists is really important and supporting artists is really important. Um, arts is a part of our everyday lives, whether it's music, whether it's you watching, watching films, acting, whatever it is, art, visual art, um, poetry, literature, all of it is a way to tell a story, to convey feelings and emotions. And it's always open to your own interpretation as well. And I think what you've done with this film, which is why I was so keen to work with you, was that you've told a story, but it's 
for me to take it how I want to take it. Um, and that's really important. You're not, um, you don't preach to anybody that this is what you have to do. And like you say, it's a very balanced film and it, it is important for lots of people to make up their own minds. Um, I remember seeing comments about how this situation here being the farmer's own fault. What do you say to people who say that to you? The situation in toxification? Intoxication. So all the themes that recur, we've, you know, we've, we've heard some of them in the trailer, um, that these situations are the farmer's own fault. What do you say to that, having lived with the farmers there? I think, um, again, taking a balanced view, I think it's not just kind of one person's fault or one group's fault. Um, I think that uh, the farmers, yes, can take responsibility for some of their failings. <clears throat> and I think also there are, um, there have been a lot of challenges kind of placed upon them. Um, so yeah, it's probably a mixture of the two, but I would really love to see the farmers also taking responsibility and making changes themselves. It's not, again, this film is not about um, kind of blaming the farmers and it's also not about um, pushing the blame onto the government or anything like that. It's, it's not that kind of film and I don't see the world like that, you know? Mm. So last year, at the beginning of last year, before lockdown, you managed to go back to Amritsar and do your first screening in India, in Punjab. Um, and it was a really special screening for you. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Because you did have a government minister present at that screening. Yeah, so um, yeah, I was really blessed to have got that trip in just before lockdown. Um, <clears throat> so the screening was at... Um, one of the venues which you'll see in the film um and some of the you know some of the people who were in the film were there and i got to meet them after all those years and that was really really special um and i think one thing that had been really important to me <coughs> excuse me was um ensuring that this film was going to go back to punjab and that people were going to see it in punjab because i think also in punjab there are lots of people who also don't understand the issue in its kind of entirety, or maybe they don't understand um, the way that um, different issues are connected. And so, again, there, there can be a lot of blame and a lot of, um, um, yeah, yeah, blame and um, prejudice against different people. And I think for me, it was important that people watch this film in order to take a step back and understand from everyone's perspective what's going on. Um, so yeah, that was really important for me. And we did have a government minister present, um, which was, yeah, really, really special as well. And I got to speak to him afterwards and, um, yeah. Was it taken positively or was it, how was it seen by him? Yeah, it was seen positively. Um, I think as a kind of government official, he also was, uh, yeah, I mean, he had to, he had to be uh, kind of unbiased yeah. as well and, and kind of maybe hold his tongue and things like that. So yeah, I don't know um, exactly what his thoughts were, but I did have a conversation with him afterwards and he said that he was going to do everything that he could um, to make some changes and to support the farmers. Okay, and talking about the themes in the film and you touched on your first year audience being non-Asian, non punjabi non um, the themes in the film, I feel, are global. And recently I've watched um, a short film on the BBC, actually, about British farmer suicide. And when you look into that film, it's the same kind of themes that come up. How relevant do you feel is your film globally? I think it's relevant to everyone because we all eat food. Like, essentially, that's that's what it boils down to. Most of us don't grow our own food. Most of us are eating food which is um, grown by a farmer that we don't know. Um, so this film is relevant to everyone. And, and you're right, the issues in this film are replicated you know, in many other parts of the world. Um, so yeah, this is, I think if it's not already, this is gonna become a global issue because farmer suicide is it's not um, unique to India or to Punjab. It's a phenomenon which is happening in, in lots of other parts of the world as well. Um, but yeah, if you eat food, you know, it, it's, a, it's a film which should or kind of may interest you. Um, so yeah, and I've had my own 
journey since filming Toxification with my connection with my food, as well as my connection with my culture, um, and, and just kind of going on a journey of understanding more about what goes into our food and um, where it's sourced and how it's sourced and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's definitely been a journey. Yeah, because I remember, I remember when I used to talk to my manji and she'd say to me, this nimbu, this lemon, it's, it's not nimbu as we call it a nimbu. You know, lime is what nimbu is, not yeah. And she'd be like, that's what we use there. So that's what I want, buy me that and not this. And she'd be like, you know, a gadget isn't, this isn't the real color, color of a gadget and this isn't the real this and you know, this isn't usly this. You know, it, it's, it's really interesting to hear the farmer's point of view um, and coming be, being the granddaughter of, of, of a farmer, um, how they understood the difference even here in the UK when they were eating something. She was very quick to comment on this isn't real. This isn't true to what it should be. It's not, you know, and it just makes you wonder with all that we talk about the pesticides in the film, uh, is, you know, is what we eat right now healthy for us? Do we, if we see loads of programs on TV right now, do we know what we're eating and how is, how has food been processed? Um, so, you, you know, you've already touched on that question I was going to ask you. So how has that touched on your own food journey, but your own personal journey about being more pure in your food and your thoughts and your sort of mindfulness? Yeah, I think um, I've been on my own journey. So since 2014, um, I got really into yoga and I actually trained as a yoga teacher um, a couple of years ago. And so my kind of personal journey has included mindfulness um i've done a lot of um trainings on trauma and um uh you know the kind of mental health side of things so that's something that's you know really interesting for me and um i kind of hope to make more films which are going to build on the kind of journey that i've started on um but yeah i mean in terms of like kind of this way of living i feel like lockdown has taught us a new or, or maybe many of us or some of us a new way of um living and a way of slowing down and so i've personally been really interested in mindful living slow living so just generally taking a bit more care being a bit more mindful about what we're doing what we're putting into our bodies you know it, and that's not just food that's also what we're watching um, you know, the conversations that we're having, all of that kind of stuff. So going on this kind of holistic journey, and I think toxification played a part in that because toxification was where I learnt, um, you know, all of these uh, rituals and ways of living. Um, these things are natural to our ancestors or maybe our families in Punjab. Um, it's, it's very normal to not have an alarm and to wake up because there is a cow outside your house. <laughs> you know, that's what we experienced when we were filming. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a Gurdwara kind of in every, um, I don't know, part of land. So essentially you can, when you um, wake up, you can hear Japji Sahib from the Gurdwara, from the nearest Gurdwara. Um, and like throughout the um, bind, you, every bind we went to, you could always hear it. So um, I'm sure there are lots and lots of Gurdwaras and that's how you wake up. And I think for me, I'd moved away from that a lot and I'd moved away from um, just spending time enjoying things um, in favor of, of the rat race of life and trying to you know, push myself and, and further my career and things like that. So being able to slow down in lockdown has um, been really beneficial for me. And I think that's, yeah, that's another part of toxification which hasn't really been covered, but I think it's, it's um it's captured in the journey of the film i think doshan singh says it in the trailer that we just watched um green revolution being the greed revolution and it, it's sort of do we really need this lockdowns asked us made us ask these questions do we really need this right now what, what do we need do we need thousands of people at weddings can we have a small wedding i think even things like that in our community which we've just kind of lost context i feel um yeah, I think there, there is definitely something to think about that with lockdown and what we're eating and what we're doing in our daily lives and what we're consuming, be it food and otherwise. But I think also, um, I think farming seems to be a very spiritual way of life as well. And we forget that for our ancestors, you know, food. We talk about the motherland, we talk about the, the, the earth. It's very, very 
we're very connected to the soil. Yeah. We all need food to live and the people that provide the food, people that provide for all of us should be respected is the feeling. And that's what the farmers' protests have really kind of carried that message forward for everybody. Now, um, I want to go back to you and your journey as a filmmaker. For me, as, an, as sort of an artistic director, that's really, really important because when you first came to me, you were a very different person to who you are now. How has this film in particular changed you? I know you've done other projects along the way, but how has this film changed you? As it's, a taught me, it's taught me so much, so much. I think um, it's been my biggest teacher. Um, so in terms of the process of filmmaking, I've, I think the, the biggest takeaway has been, if you don't do it, no one else will. So, you know, with this, journey with toxification it's been really like at some point it's been a really grueling journey of just championing this film and getting a you know a lot of closed doors and I think that's probably um a journey which many people can resonate with um you know whatever whatever they do if you're doing something new and if you're paving the way you are going to get some closed doors um so I, I learned a lot about um just being a bit more resilient and um just carrying on and and the idea that if I don't do it no one else will and feeling that responsibility to there do were that. those moments with you there were those moments where you would call me up and be like I just can't do this anymore I just I just don't want to do this anymore I can't do it but it was like no you're going somewhere with this just stick with it stick with it it was a tough journey at times it really was but I'm glad you've stuck with it and like you said things happen for a reason and our end goal was always to get this film on a mainstream platform but it just about when we got to that point the farmers protests happened um but you as a filmmaker you know you you're i think your outlook on filmmaking has so changed um yeah. in terms of what you'd like to do you seem very certain what kind of filmmaker you are now so how do you see yourself yeah so um during this process and during the last few years of learning more about um mental health and trauma and things like that i've i've learned a lot about the filmmaking process being very powerful and so um, the the idea of kind of just going in like parachuting in taking my stories and then parachuting out doesn't really work for me anymore um, although it worked for toxification and it you know it created something which is really really valuable um, and lots of filmmakers I mean most filmmakers work in that way especially documentary filmmakers where there isn't really much of a budget um, usually uh, but yeah, for me, that doesn't work so well anymore. For me, the next film that I make, and I plan to make um, more films uh, in, a, in a kind of similar vein. Obviously, 2014, um, 2014 was a long time ago, so toxification might look a little bit dated. In, in that sense, you know, things, things are changing and things will be different with, with the work that I will create in the future. But in terms of subject matter, um, in terms of the way that I like to film in terms of the kind of the softness and the slowness and the gentleness um, and the depth of the, you know, the films I'd like to make, that that's going to be similar. Um, but what I'd like to do is to be able to offer um, maybe, you know, workshops while I'm, um, to, you know, while I'm creating this film so that I can give back or maybe there's a counsellor who can come with me to support these farmers or maybe I can do some I don't know yoga um, sessions I just I just feel that it's important to be able to give back and not just be taking because if you're on um, you know when you're on one side of the camera looking at a subject it's a very powerful place to be and it's I think it can be very disempowering to be on the other end of a camera um, so yeah <clears throat> in that sense that's something that I'd like to change but in terms of the actual the, the actual work it's going to be very similar and I'm really excited to um, move forward and begin making some work obviously with um, lockdown and COVID we've had some delays but I'm hoping to make um, more films about Punjab there's a problem of female infanticide in Punjab and I'd love to make a film about that um, and I'm I'm really grateful to Toxification for um, supporting me with with um, a platform and really grateful to everyone who's um, on this call, everyone who's watched Toxification for um, kind of enabling me to be able to make more work and have an audience for it. Um, so, yeah, really, really grateful just for the journey. I want to touch on something that's really important 
and we started off this webinar with it. So I thanked, uh, um, I congratulated Elman about getting some funding. Now, you went out on this journey, you didn't have very much money, you had put a crowdfunder together, Gashi House has supported you, they were your headline sponsor actually, in fact, um, and you had other sponsors as well. Where do you find money how, how, for this film and what's going, what's going to happen with the proceeds of, I mean, we put um, um, the film up on Amazon Prime for not very much. Um, what happens with the proceeds of this film? Yeah, so um, firstly, this entire process, the um, core team, which is myself, Girith, Leva, and our friend Nahayan, um, everyone has been working on this in a voluntary capacity from 2014 until now, until the future. So no one is ever going to take um, any um, kind of like remuneration from this whole um, project. <clears throat> uh, we did do a crowdfunder in 2015, which was to cover the costs of um, the soundtrack and sound engineering, which were things that we couldn't do in-house. Everything else we did in-house. Literally, this film was uh, a labor of love. <clears throat> and so, um, yeah, so we did a crowdfunder to cover those costs. And then to get the film into cinemas, again, we asked for sponsors. And, and like you mentioned, Kashi House was our headline sponsor. And we had a number of other sponsors, which we're so, so grateful for, because without them, it wouldn't have been able to kind of get to cinemas. Um, in, in terms of the proceeds, <coughs> excuse me, I've got like, I think, because I've been talking so much. Talking like, <laughs> um, in terms of the proceeds, so... Uh, we also had to, um, we've been really, really kind of frugal with our money between Gilith and I. <clears throat> Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so we've been really, really frugal with our money. And, um, you know, we, we really feel a sense of responsibility that, you know, people and organizations have given us this money. And, and obviously we're, we, um, we want it to go as far as we can. So we've been super, super frugal um, with everything. And we've managed to have um, a little bit left over after the cinema screenings, which we put um, firstly towards getting it onto Amazon Prime Video. So there's a um, whole kind of technical process, which I won't bore you with, but essentially it costs money <laughs> in order to get it packaged for Amazon Prime. And so we spent um, that money on that. We do have a little bit left. And the plan is that we're going to um, put together whatever we've got left with whatever is made from the Amazon Prime uh, kind of proceeds and then personally kind of give that to the two families that we filmed, the two families who, um, the kind of suicide families, so they're families of farmers who have committed or attempted suicide. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my personal pledge that that's, what is going to happen with the money in terms of Amazon Prime I'll be completely honest um you know it's not a money maker <laughs> so I know that we'll get uh because the film hasn't been on Amazon Prime for a month yet we get kind of our earnings at the end of the month but at the moment we've we've made like 10 pounds so yeah it's it's not a money maker but that that was never important to me that was never the goal the goal was always to ensure as many people as possible watch this film so yeah it's not a, it's not a kind of um money making project by any means um but I, I do hope that in the future i can um get funding to make work like this because it has been a really challenging time it has been challenging it's been difficult to think where do we spend money do we put it on and i think lots of artists face that lots and lots of artists face that whether they're filmmakers whether they're um, or writing a book, whether they're putting together an exhibition for something or making music or, or writing a play and trying to put that on the stage. It, it is a challenge so many artists face. And a, along with sort of Punjabi artists, there's that tokenism as well, like trying to get away from that and getting credit for the actual work that you're doing rather than being a token. Um, I think that's really, really important. But I wanted to... Um, go back to what you said about the film being dated. So I just made a note about something you said about the film being dated and made, being made in 2014. You visited at the beginning of last year. Did you personally feel the situation had changed when you met everybody? No, I'm sorry to say I, I didn't see uh, a positive change. I think if anything there, um, from what I saw, the situation is, is even more challenging. I mean, I had been to 
um, Punjab, I think, in, uh, in 2017 for another film project. And there I realized, I mean, I met a young girl who was probably three or four years old and um, she, she was like begging and she kept asking for money, which is very common in Punjab and in India. Um, and I didn't really think anything of it, but the gentleman that I was filming with who was from Punjab uh, told me that that young girl was on drugs. And I, I was like completely shocked. And he, he was like, yeah, look at her eyes. And yeah, I mean, what can you say? It's, it's not a good situation. I don't think it's got any better. If anything, it looked to me as if it had um, kind of got more and more challenging. And yeah, I suppose we'll see what happens after these, um, you know, after whatever, whatever happens in the future. Well, I'm really looking forward to what you're going to make next. And, and just before you go, what are your favourite memories of the whole process? Oh, it was amazing. It was really, really amazing. The actual filming was obviously what I live for. I mean, that that's the most fun part. Um, so, like I said, waking up to literally cows outside your window. Um, we used to film at sunrise and sunset because during the day it was just too bright and too like the shadows were too harsh and so we'd wake up at the crack of dawn we'd set up while it was dark and as the sun was rising we'd get these amazing interviews um yeah that's one of them the family that we stayed with lent us two jeeps so we were driving around Bundabi like farmland in two jeeps and it was just oh it was just so brilliant it was so amazing and being able to connect with my heritage and my roots in that way was yeah it was so unexpected but a really really amazing journey oh well it's been a privilege to be on a small part of that journey with you and i'm really excited to see what's coming next from you and i think now is probably a good time to um take some questions if there are any so yeah while you're um selecting some questions i'll just say that um, toxification is like we said it's available on amazon prime video so if you search for toxification it'll come up um, and that's in the uk and usa if you're not in the uk and usa you can watch it on a new platform called nishani plus um, and that is global so wherever in the world you can watch it on nishani plus if you just google them you'll find it it's n-i-s-h-a-a-n-i plus Thank you. It's been really hard to not be able to talk about the actual film when you've watched it so many times and not to give so much away. But it's, you know, it's been a bit of a challenge for me not to give so much away because there's so much you want to talk about. And uh, it's quite different from doing a Q&A with you in live after, after a screening. But it have got some really interesting questions coming in. And one of them, um, Anoop Dosanj, you've said your uncle made a television film in early 2000 covering some of the farming issues and it wasn't it wasn't quite the same as toxification but it raised similar issues same issues um and it's really he says it's really sad that 20 years on we're still seeing all the same challenges if not amplified as you've just said to ensure we're not talking about the same issues another 20 years on what action do you think we can now take is there one single thing that we as individuals outside of the Punjab can do to make a real difference? I wish there was an easy answer to that question. Um, <clears throat> for me, uh, yeah, for me, I can't, I can't kind of um, say one thing which will help. I think it has to be a concerted effort. I think there have to be a number of organizations which get together and create a long-term solution. I don't think it's just a case of pumping uh, money into Punjab I don't think that's um, a long-term solution so although there are a lot of people that are donating and I think that's great I also wonder um, if that's if that's going to ensure longevity um, so that's one thing I think for me I've um, reconciled with the idea that um, it's a really challenging situation and um, I you know feeling really helpless about it by doing some research on where my food is coming from and trying to um, be a bit more kind of ethical in, in the way that I do that. And also just, I think it's a massive thing just to watch toxification and just to educate yourself and just to tell friends and family, whether they're Punjabi or not, just to kind of educate them on it and encourage them to watch it. I think that's a massive thing. And, and yes, we do feel helpless here. And, and 
there isn't, you know, one thing, you know, I wish I could say, yeah, just um, donate to me and I'll go and fix everything. But, you know, I'm afraid it's not that simple. It's, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's tough. And um, Vegetable Role Mill asks, um, that the film's shown that de-addiction rehab centres have helped in Punjab. Do you know if the Punjab government has showed any initiative in establishing more centres? I don't know. So the centre that we um, we were filming at, um, I'm not sure it was a government, uh, like a governmental institution, um, but I know that the government do have some um, some kind of things in place to support um, Punjabis who are struggling with drug addiction. But I just don't know if it's enough or if it's um, or if those kind of ways of doing things work. So the de addiction centre that we filmed at is absolutely brilliant and amazing because they work on every level. So they work on the social side, they work on the spiritual side, they work on the physical and the mental. Um, so, you know, that was really important. But yeah, I don't know about the government. I mean, we've spoken in Q and A's before and I always say that in terms of the government and their, um, their stance in Punjab, I always kind of think back to our history as Punjabis and as Sikhs and just think about the times which we've faced tyranny and we faced challenge and we've not been supported by the kind of government or whoever was ruling the lands at that time and there are like there are lots and lots of times when you know we've been unsupported and as a community i wonder if it's time to focus on our community and how we can support ourselves rather than um kind of like placing the blame on the the governments or expecting them to help us out of this situation i'm not saying this situation is our fault i'm just saying is there a way that we as Punjabis, as Sikhs, can come together and support ourselves maybe in the way that we might have done previously maybe you know there have been situations in the past where we have never been supported by um, whoever has ruled but we've managed to find our way through and maybe that's maybe that's something to think about now as well do you think we've lost as Punjabis as Sikhs we've lost our fighting spirit in that sense do you think it's more noise but less action what do you think do we are we expecting others to help us rather than us getting up and helping ourselves yeah I think there is an expectation that others will help um and I you know I've felt that as well I've you know felt frustrated that there isn't an organization coming and contacting me and saying we'll do all the work now <laughs> so you know we all want that we all want for someone to um take ownership and and take the kind of like initiative and and lead on a project um and there are organizations which are doing really great work in Punjab but yeah I mean uh, you know I, I'm not going to say that I haven't also felt like I wish someone would kind of save Punjab and, and take it upon themselves to do that. And um, so thank you for that question there, Jabal. But, um, Robin Percival, thank you for your question, because this is really interesting. So we, this is a story on the Jarada Punjab side, the east side of Punjab. Um, so Lenda Punjab, the Pakistan side of the border. Um, do you know if these issues exist there? Yeah, from what I know, I haven't done extensive research into it the way that I did with toxification. But from what I know, there are many, many similar challenges. And I think probably, I mean, in terms of the um, drug abuse, that's the route that the drugs take into Punjab. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if um, you know, that area is really struggling as well. Okay, that's interesting to hear. Um, so we're talking now about... Um, female, females and women farmers. So we've been talking a lot about them. There's been a lot of talk about females um, and women farmers during the farmers' protests. And Manmeet Mataru asks, um, did you come across addiction? I know you've touched on this just now. Did you come across addiction in, in the female subgroup as well? Or is it a male issue? So farmer suicides predominantly being male. Yeah, I think... Um... I think it is an issue. Um, so one of our farmers told us about how uh, everyone in his family used to take different forms of opium. And it was a very common thing to see it sitting there and to see women and men taking it. And so, yeah, I don't see why there would not be a drug problem in women. Um, and the statistics don't 
like the statistics are not just about men, they're actually about both. Um, and yeah, in terms of women farmers, I think, I think we haven't kind of focused on them in toxification because, um, you know, this, this film, the stories were about the farmers that we spoke with, but I think there are always, you know, every field we went to, every family that we filmed, there were always women who were working in the fields as well. They might not be, um, you know, like the top dogs or they might not be the kind of faces of toxification, but they're there, they're there in the film and they're there at the, you know, you know they're, they're in Delhi and they're, they're, they're behind, you know. I mean, you talk about that whole thing about um, everybody taking part and, you know, part partaking in the opium and, and, and the drugs as well. But do you feel that, I mean, the stories, it's been quite normal for everyone to take a bit of bung as a bit of a, um, a what do you call it, a, a tonic? You know, it was to help them. But do you think that kind of thing, everything in moderation and it's been abused, or do you think it should, just shouldn't have been there in the first place? I mean, I think of Bhangra. And what are the explanations of Bhangra has always been Bhang, it's come from Bhangaragar, where they used to work in the fields, they used to take a bit of Bhang. And we have um, stories of our grandparents and great, great grandparents, tell it, great grandparents telling us, you know, they used to like a little bit in the pakore and off they went, you know, that kind of thing. And it was so normal, it felt, it feels, but it didn't feel wrong because it was seen as a tonic. How do you, what do you think of those things, those stories when you hear them? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a huge amount of kind of experience in this. I've never heard any of these stories in my family. But I know when I got married, um, I remember my um, in-laws talking about um, their kind of mother just um, like taking opium and just literally just knocking it back, basically. Um, that, yeah, for me, that's really shocking. Uh, but obviously it, it has been a big part of Punjabi's lives and it still is. And that's why it's a normal thing in the houses there. So it, clearly there's a sort of cultural element which is um, normalised. And for us, it might seem really, you know, surprising that, you know, there are parents who are encouraging young children to take it just so that they are quiet. But if it's, you know, if it's normal, if it's a reality, then who are we to judge? OK, it's really interesting that you say that um, because it is very different to turn things that have been going on to turn things around that have been happening for generations and generations and it's like when do you stop when do you stop being more open and I think it's the same here as well um so going back to I've got a question here from Ranjit Ranjit Jutley thank you for your question it's it's about the Indian authorities and um did you come across any problems with the Indian authorities in making the film and given the current climate in India the plight of the farmer and the heavy-handedness of the authorities there he says this type of film would not be possible today. Now, I know that you have it in you, you re you're determined to kind of make a toxification to a follow-up or um, follow up the themes in this film. How do you feel that's going to affect you? Yeah, um, you know, seeing the, the um, injustices that have happened in the mm. last few months has been really shocking. Even I remember when I went... Um, in 2019, yeah, 2019, when I went um, to Punjab, even then I, I kind of felt a bit um, unsure as I was kind of like crossing the border and things like that. You, you do always get a bit nervous, but I, I'm much more nervous now for sure. Um, and I have friends who have been posting about these issues on their social media and they're, they're also feeling very nervous about going back. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know, really know how to feel about that. And I'm just hoping that things will calm down and I'll be able to um, safely travel there again. I, I mean, I personally remember when you first said to me, I want to go back, I'm ready to go right now. And I didn't want to say it to you. And I was like, I mean, I said it to Amrit, who works alongside me in Punjab Arts. Um, and, and I said, I don't want Rem to go because I don't think it's it's a safe environment to her to, for her to go and make a film. Um, we've seen what's been happening out there, but... But, it, you know, as a filmmaker, you get caught in the middle of the politics. And how does that make you feel? Toxification was never a political film. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite sad that we've become embroiled in politics because that was never the intention of the film. Um, and 
I mean, to think that I'm, you know, me going back might not be safe is actually crazy because, you know, anyone who's watched Toxification and anyone that will to watch Toxification will note that there's nothing you know, political about the film. And, and the film does, um, like we've said, it is neutral and it does, um, you know, showcase the points where the farmers could be doing more to support themselves. So, yeah, if you watch the film, you'll know that there should be no issue with me going to Punjab. Um, but yeah, I mean, it kind of speaks for itself. But how, yeah, how do you feel about your film being politicised? Because it's out of your hands. You, you've made yeah. the film, you put it out there now. Um, it's out of your How do you feel about giving that control of how the film's viewed over to your audience? I think once you um, make a film, it's kind of like your baby and you, you have to like, you have to let it go and you have to allow it to be watched um, because everyone who watches it will take away something different from it and we all have a lens through which we see the world um, and so we're all going to see toxification differently because we see the world differently so that I feel like that's out of my hands um, but yeah I mean it, it is a bit um, to know that that was never my intention you know for, for anything to come across um, badly or anything like that is um, yeah it's a bit frustrating but I think you just have to accept that as a filmmaker you know it's not it's not mine anymore and I, I, I reached like it might sound a bit silly but I reached a bit of a milestone because I've got my kind of personal um, social media account and then I've got Toxification and Toxification's followers um, like kind of uh, was more like basically overtook my personal pages followers and that was the moment where I realized that this is not my baby anymore this is actually more than that and it's its own entity it's got its own lifespan mm. and um, I yeah kind of just have to allow that to be okay that's really interesting because sometimes an artist wants to hold on to the meaning of that but I, I feel very strongly that once you put something out there a piece of work out there be a painting be it a piece of music it's up for the up to the audience to interpret it how they feel but given the current climate you know like you're saying it must be quite frustrating you're on lots and lots of panels at the moment discussing the farmers protest how do you feel um i yeah i mean you might have noticed that i try not to talk too much about the farmers protest because um number one i haven't been there to see it and i haven't been there to speak to people and to understand on a human level um, what's going on and how it's affecting people. Obviously, I've seen a lot on social media and in the news, um, but not having been there, I, I don't really feel qualified to speak about it. The other thing is we don't know what's going to happen when the, um, you know, if or when the bills are, like, you know, in the future, what, what, whatever happens, we don't know what's going to happen. I've got friends who um, are, you know, really studious and they've, they've really, really spent a lot of time educating themselves on this situation and they say that the the bills will actually support the small scale farmers and I've also kind of got people who are saying the opposite and saying that it's going to become really challenging for the farmers so the bottom line is that we don't know uh, what we do know is that the situation now is pretty bad so something has to change so yeah I try not to speak about the laws because or the bills because um, I just don't feel qualified to okay so that I mean I think Brenda Gill I've seen your question and, and he's saying that you you very much seem to have foreseen the slow train crash unfolding and he's asking for your predictions on the farmer's plight in the next decade. Do you have a view on that given what you've just said? Yeah, on a personal level, um, I, it, it seems to me that, um, that you know, privatisation might occur and, and there might be corporates which come in due to the fact that, you know, farmers can now stockpile and all of these different things for me, it seems like it was a challenging situation before and this is not going to help. I think this is going to make farming more challenging for farmers. But yeah, that's that's just my own speculation. For me, watching a film, your film also gave hope. Um, but given what's happened, do you think they just managed it really badly? They could have done it in a different way. Do you ever feel that? What, in terms of the... the... Farmers being consulted or not consulted or how they're being helped I don't know if um it would have been different if the farmers had been consulted I I think um they still wouldn't have been happy um so yeah I don't know I think um 
I'm not going to talk too much about the hope in the film because it would kind of give away the ending, but there is hope and I still believe in the principles that are shared in toxification. I really do. And I think that is the only hope for Punjab. Okay. Inda, you ask a really interesting question. Um, how did you decide which farmers to include in the final documentary? Um, he's watched the film and he thinks you had a really good range. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, it was it was luck and grace. So we uh, arrived in Punjab. So actually, I have to go back in order to answer this question in a really full way. Um, so Leva and I had had a conversation in the beginning of 2014. And um, she had said to me, right, um, can you contact some farmers, your Punjabi? So like, that's your role. That's your kind of to do list. And I had said, yeah, 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 I'll do that. And in the back of my head, I was thinking, how am I going to do that? Um, and so I put down the phone and I I kind of stared at my laptop screen and I was like, how am I going to contact these farmers? I've got no family in Punjab. I don't even speak Punjabi. I've got no friends in Punjab. Like, who can I even call? So I did the only thing that I could think of doing, which was to go on Facebook. And I searched for, <laughs> I just searched for farmers of Punjab. And um, lo and behold, there was a group called Farmers of Punjab. And um, so I clicked on it and all of the posts were in Punjabi. And I was like, well, I, I can't type in Punjabi, so I'll just write in English. So I just wrote, my name is Ramath, I'm a filmmaker, I want to make this film. And um, I posted it and literally less than a minute later, I had a phone call from an Indian number. And it was a farmer and he said, thank you so much for um, like wanting to make this film. Don't worry about anything, I will sort out everything. Um, and and he did. And so we literally turned up at his farm. We, we got a lift to his farm in the middle of nowhere. And we stayed with him for about three weeks. Uh, this complete stranger. And the day after we had arrived, he had already arranged for all of the farmers in the entire area to come to his house so that we could meet them all. And um, yeah, it was a process. I mean, having done some research, we knew um, what some of the topics might be. So we kind of had an idea of the um, the kind of people that we were looking for. And so we interviewed each one, just just kind of like got an understanding of the way they speak and the things they speak about. Um, and then we selected from there. There was one farmer which um, who we, we had heard a lot about um, and we were really struggling to kind of find him. And we were trying to like, you know, we could find him on Google, but we couldn't like we didn't there was no number or anything like that and we were really struggling to meet him and then um we had just this random conversation with some random guy who came to the house who's like some relative or something and he literally said i'll pick you up tomorrow and i'll take you to his farm like it was it was like that it was complete grace um and luck that we managed to find such amazing subjects who were so honest and open with their sharing Okay, so um, just following on from that, talking about the farmers that you selected, Ravindra Deep, I'm just going to just pick up on your question there. Was there any support available for the farmers to talk through the issues that you raised in your film with them post the interview? And I know you've discussed this already. Were you able to do something with them? Um, so I'm still in contact with a lot of them. Um, so, so there's that. But yeah, I do feel that if I were to make a film now, I wouldn't do it in the same way because essentially we were only there for a month and then we came back. Um, so in the future, I would love to bring a counsellor with me or someone with me and, and be able to have those kind of long term conversations with those people and be able to support them in some way. Um, but yeah, at, at that time, it was it wasn't even something that I thought of, to be perfectly honest. This is um, the way that we made toxification in that sense is pretty normal. I mean, most of the documentaries that you watch, they don't have counsellors as part of their team or they don't have mental health support therapists or anyone. You know, that's not it's not a normal thing to see in a in a film crew. But that's not an excuse. OK, I'm really conscious of the time. There's so many questions coming in, but I'm going to try and get a couple, a couple more in. Afsar Bansji, thank you so much for your question. Um, you say it's sad to hear about, about the amount of apathy and ignorance amongst our own community, um, Punjabi, Indian or Sikh. How do we get films like this to break through to the mainstream, through the mainstream narrative of Indian media on the farmers' protest? So 
a bit of a political question, but just I would like to hear from you how do we get this message through and get these get films like this, social documentaries like this, through to a mainstream audience. Not necessarily just Indian, but just our audiences, because that was a challenge you faced. Yeah, I think platforms are really important. So that was why we went into cinemas rather than Gurdwaras. Um, and that was why we wanted it on a mainstream platform like Amazon Prime. Um, so yeah, I think that's really important. I think it's important to be sharing um, these topics and these films with our kind of non-Indian friends. Um, but I think for me, what's been really supportive about having it on Amazon Prime is that I can now potentially go to Netflix or you know another another kind of um, platform like that or BBC or whatever and I can say this film is on Amazon Prime and it's been watched by this number of people so you need to take notice you know you need to um, have a look at this um, work that I'm pitching to you so I think it's important to support our um, you know the, the artists and the filmmakers and the photographers in our community and help to give them platforms so that they can walk up that ladder and be able to deliver more of you know more similar work to the masses okay and i think it's time for one more question i'm going to end it on a light-hearted note because it's been such a heavy topic um sorry to everybody else's questions um we we haven't been able to answer but maybe i mean there's a way we can we can do that um but how it has your Punjabi improved? I would like to know. <laughs> I was going to ask you this earlier as well. So that would be really interesting. <laughs> We've had these discussions ourselves. So, yeah. Yeah, I have a long way to go. Um, <laughs> yeah, it has, it has improved a lot. I mean, um, in terms of the, like, in terms of farmer speak, I, you know, I know a lot about you know how to speak about wheat and rice and things but I don't know if that really supports me in the real world um yeah I mean on a personal level I've got a couple of apps on my phone and my parents are like have you learned Punjabi yet have you learned Punjabi yet so <laughs> it's definitely something that I'm really um keen on and that's kind of my own journey has your conversational Punjabi improved no because I'm too nervous to actually speak it <laughs> I get it I, um, yeah, just I get speak it <laughs> I get the tenses wrong and, and then I just feel like a fool. <laughs> oh, no, there's no feeling of fool just to speak it. Otherwise, we're going to lose that as well. So yeah, true. Yeah, I think it's really important. But I'm, I'm glad I'm glad it improved your understanding. And you've been I think a lot of people have commented that you're really lucky that you felt the first hand hospitality, first hand the hospitality of Punjab as well. So I think, you know, I think you're more Punjabi than you give yourself credit for. Oh, that's very kind. <laughs> well, I think we're going to leave it there for the questions. And um, thank you to everybody who's joined us on this webinar. And Rem, would you like to remind people before we go of how people can watch the film if they haven't done so already? Yep. So UK and USA is Amazon Prime Video. You can just search for it. And anywhere else in the world is Nishani Plus. And please follow us on social media. We are at Toxification Doc, which is DOC for documentary. Thank you, Ramit, for your time. Thank you to UKPHA Book Club. Um, and I've got to say, if you haven't seen some of the other book clubs, some of them are online on YouTube and things, and you can watch them back. So if you do miss stuff, it is um, a brilliant watch back with some of the other books and things as well. So make sure you support however you can all these different initiatives. It's so important to support. Punjabi arts and culture going forward, as well as recognising all the different parts that we as individuals too. Thank you so much on behalf of KPHA, Punjab Arts, myself and Remak too. Thank you so much. <laughs>